What if I told you there was a buried study conducted in the 1960s that only 50 years later was the data recovered and released to the public? And what if I told you that study showed seed oils are harming our cardiovascular health? Well, that's not what I'm claiming, but it is claimed by many, including some doctors, like Dr. Paul Mason, a sports medicine physician that makes the rounds against seed oils. Those are vegetable oils extracted from plants like soybean oil, canola oil, safflower oil, and so on. So we're going to hear what Dr. Mason outlines in relation to this hidden study recently released to the public by a separate group of researchers, and then we're going to separate fact from fiction. If any fiction exists, of course, because it could very well be that this study has simply been buried to stop the truth from getting out. Let's hear about this study. You may have also heard of the Sydney Diet Heart Study, a good quality randomized control trial examining in men who'd had heart attacks, the effect of replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, and the result on whether or not this diet actually reduced the risk of death was actually destined to never be published. That's right, it was only a stroke of luck that a researcher uncovered the original study data in a basement and was able to decode it and publish it some 40 years after the study was concluded. And so, in 2013, the results of the Sydney Diet Heart Study were finally published in the British Medical Journal. The conclusion, reducing saturated fat in the diet and increasing polyunsaturated fats increased the risk of death by 62%. Wow, that's astonishing. I mean, if we step back and think about that, that flies in the face of so many other studies. This study indicates reducing saturated fat and increasing omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, those are the seed oils, leads to an over 60% increase in death. Holy cow, saturated fat and all. That's a bombshell. And then, the fact that this study was buried and only recently, well, over 10 years ago now, published, really has one wondering if these scientists were deceiving the public with their malevolent... What's this? Could it be? How is this possible? Dare I admit it? The original study published by the original authors has spawned out of the annals of history. But hold on, I thought this study was buried and only recently recovered. Am I dreaming or was that whole narrative a bunch of crock? Surely not. Well, Regardless of if this study was buried or not, the fact remains the seed oil group experienced a massive increase in death. Let's look at the data from the original study, and then let's bring in some additional damning data from the new analysis. Here, we're seeing the survival over five years consuming either a seed oil diet or a saturated fat favored diet, the dotted line and the solid line respectively. If the lines go down, that means that there's less survival, a bad thing. So Dr. Mason is absolutely right when saying that there's an increase in death from the seed oil diet. In fact, the bad news doesn't end there because in a more recent analysis that Dr. Mason brings up, the researchers were able to tease out not only all-cause mortality data, but also cardiovascular-specific disease. The blue line is the seed oil group. This time, the higher the line goes, the greater the cardiovascular disease incidence. That's a 70% increased risk in cardiovascular disease, by the way. So, some pretty scary stuff. But there have been some critiques of these two studies, the suddenly published original study and the reanalysis. And Dr. Mason, to his credit, addresses some of them. This is probably one of the most important bits of research you've never heard about. And truth be told, one that you almost didn't find out about. Now, of course, evidence like this, which undermines the orthodox view on dietary fat, is not going to be unchallenged. And indeed, it did face a barrage of criticism, most of it deceptive and irrelevant. The one argument that most often gets repeated is that the 62% increased risk of death was due to an increase in trans fat consumption. Specifically, it is claimed that the margarine consumed in the intervention group was high in trans fat. And for all intents and purposes, this argument is the only justification 
these saturated fat fearing zealots have for ignoring the harms of polyunsaturated seed oils. This argument, however, is flawed. It comes down to the difference between hard and soft margarines. Hard margarine did, back then, contain trans fats. However, the margarine used in the study was Miracle brand, a soft margarine, and clearly advertised as such. And soft margarines contained very little, if any, trans fats. And the consumption of biscuits, cakes, pastries and puddings, all of which were often made with trans fat containing hard margarine, was expressly discouraged in the intervention group. Furthermore, safflower oil, which also contains little if any trans fat, was used in the intervention group, further displacing other sources of trans fats. The upshot of all this is that the trans fat intake of the intervention group almost certainly reduced, which leaves us with the uncomfortable truth that the increase in polyunsaturated oils in the diet, as recommended by our current dietary guidelines, increased the chance of dying by 62% all shown by a good quality, long-term, randomized control trial. Okay, some pretty harsh words there from Dr. Mason. And might he have a point? In fact, he does. One of the main critiques of this Sydney Heart trial is the fact that people that switched to margarine, which was this seed oil, omega-6 fat focus, would also be consuming large amounts of trans fats, as trans fats were not known to be deleterious to health. Dr. Mason then points out that this critique is deceptive, and that's because only hard margarines had trans fats in them, and the study participants consumed more Miracle brand margarine, which did not contain trans fats. Obviously, on the face of it, that's a good argument, and there's even compelling argument in that train of thought from the reanalysis researchers. They mentioned that the intervention group, the seed oil group, was instructed to avoid common margarines and were instructed to, as Dr. Mason mentioned, consume Miracle brand margarine, which contained only safflower oil and very little trans fats. So, if anything, the control group was consuming more saturated fat and trans fats from common margarines. Like I said, on the face of it, that's a good argument. But if we peek under the hood of the argument for even a millisecond, we notice some major issues. One, although we were just told that Miracle Brand had no trans fat, that's just flat incorrect. A chairman of nutrition research at Sydney University, along with other researchers, mentioned that Miracle Brand very likely had trans fats at the time, with an estimated 15% of the margarine being trans fat. In addition, in the original study, the authors mentioned that the intervention group, the seed oil group, were told to reduce their saturated fat to less than 10% of calories and to replace it with polyunsaturated fats at a minimum of 15% of calories. To be fair, it should also be mentioned that the control group was also allowed to use margarine instead of butter. However, we know for a fact that the intervention group consumed more polyunsaturated fats, and a chunk of that came from margarine containing trans fats. Not to mention that they were not discouraged from using other margarines like the control group. So, while the reanalysis researchers and Dr. Mason might speculate that trans fats were lower in the seed oil group, that seems unlikely and has been pointed out by other researchers. But we've been focused on the trans fat critique. Believe it or not, there are other critiques that aren't mentioned. So let's get into those. And if you're interested in this full analysis, I have more that I mentioned in the extended version of this video that you're watching. That video analysis, plus all the perks of the Physionic Insider membership, including a private podcast, exclusive video library, research reviews, live sessions with me, and more can be found in the description box with a Physionic Insider membership. Would love to discuss this study in more depth with you. Check it out. So far, it really seems like there's a lot of narrative and not much truth being told. In fact, I'll give you another prime example later without even introducing any new data. But for now, let's discuss a bit more on the critiques. So we've discussed how trans fats were highly likely in margarine because it was used ubiquitously at the time and margarines had trans fats. They don't anymore, FYI. However, you might have also noticed that I mentioned that the researchers allowed the control group to consume margarine when they felt like it. 
What do you think that does to the study design if you allow both groups to do similar things? It muddies the results. So statements like all shown by a good quality, long-term randomized control trial are hard to listen to when the researchers themselves acknowledge the difference between the diets wasn't as big as they'd hoped. Not to mention the researchers themselves did further analyses on the data that they had to determine what tracks strongly with the results. And they determined that diet was not associated with increased mortality and did not have predictive power. What did have predictive power was the use of digitalis, a medication used for to treat heart disease. The presence of chest pains, history of diabetes, divorce, and a few other measures of heart rhythm by electrocardiogram. All of those culminate to bad baseline heart health predicting mortality. The reason diet wasn't linked was for multiple reasons. One, the study had poor statistical power, meaning that it didn't include enough data because it didn't have enough participants to detect an effect. This was likely married to the fact that the diets had significant variability and weren't different enough from one another. It's also possible that the researchers overcorrected, statistically speaking, masking what effect might be there from the diet. The point being that even if we argue that the diet was the main factor that led to these negative results of omega-6s, there's several points that indicate the lack of reliability in these results. Of course, we could turn to this newer analysis, but even that analysis has received fair critiques, like the fact that the researchers didn't address all potential confounding variables, factors that may have actually caused the effect aside from the diet. For example, they adjusted for several factors, but did not account for all the predictive factors that we just described earlier. In addition, the original study researchers pointed out that physical activity was especially predictive of positive outcomes, i.e. reduced mortality. Again, this was not adjusted for in the newer analysis. There are some other critiques that get into study methodology and statistics, but the bottom line is it wasn't based on strong foundation of data and the reanalysis was missing some pieces. To be fair, some of this is understandable simply because, well, the sample size is too small, but it again speaks to the notion that this study is flawed in many ways that aren't being brought up. As a final point, as promised, listen to this. You may have also heard of the Sydney Diet Heart Study, a good quality randomized control trial examining in men who'd had heart attacks, the effect of replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat and the result on whether or not this diet actually reduced the risk of death was actually destined to never be published. That's right, it was only a stroke of luck that a researcher uncovered the original study data in a basement and was able to decode it and publish it some 40 years after the study was concluded. So as we went over, we somehow found the study that was never published in its published form earlier by a stroke of good fortune since we just looked for it. But I like the wording here, especially a stroke of luck that the researchers uncovered the original study data in a basement. Really gives you those, uh, we tried to bury this, but you meddling kids had to get into our affairs and ruin things. Like I promised, no new data. We can just open the same study that Dr. Mason cites and right here, we can clearly see that the reanalysis team just asked for the data from one of the original authors, this guy, and they received it. Doesn't exactly make for a compelling conspiracy, but maybe if they added in there that they had to capture him as he made a rapid escape out the back door using his walker with the data under his arm, maybe, I don't know, throw in a gunfight and some torture. Where's the data, old man? Something along those lines. Who knows? Maybe they did have to get the data from a basement, but the researchers certainly don't give the impression that this was hidden. So the takeaway here is that the Sydney Heart Trial was an ambitious endeavor, and although it was a randomized control trial, it was confounded by multiple factors pertinent to the times. The data was not hidden. It was published decades ago and further analyzed again by another team. Finally, this study is not a basis to accept or refute 
seed oils, omega-6 fats. For that, we need to look at more data, which I'll be releasing a 200 study analysis here in a few days to answer if seed oils should be avoided. It's a far bigger rabbit hole than I anticipated. Until then, check out this other seed oil conspiracy study by the ever malicious Ansel Keys. Or is it another nothing burger with saturated fat, of course?